Hi everyone! I mentioned in my last video that I would make another Tarot of the Gods video before I go to Edinburgh because, uh, again, it's been a really long time since I've made a video in this series because it's just a little bit time consuming and um, honestly I tend to just forget. I should maybe schedule it in to make one, you know, on a regular kind of basis. And I've kind of gotten through most of the original list that I wrote down as well. <clears throat> I think, to the best of my knowledge, I think that I've actually done all of the requests that I've received as well. So if any of you have any requests for future Tarot of the Gods videos, then do let me know and I will um, add them to my list. Um, but for today I'm actually doing a request um, for a lovely viewer who suggested that I might do a video on Pan or Kernunas. And she kind of mentioned that she thought it might be a bit repetitive because I did the Green Man. But actually I decided that tweaking this a bit that I would talk about the Horn God. Um, and actually I thought it would make a nice counterpart to the video on, on the Green Man because I feel that the Horned God is actually kind of encompassed of a lot of different figures, a lot of different uh, deities and um, he's sort of this weird amalgamation of a lot of different concepts and a lot of different gods and I feel like the Green Man is actually part of that and I think I mentioned that in that video that the Green Man is sort of one aspect of the Horned God and Kernunas or Pan um, who I do see as being two different figures but I might get into that a bit later in the video, um, I see that as being kind of pretty much the other half of the Horned God um, and then there are other kind of elements mixed in there as well. But just to keep things a little bit broader and also to bring in the option of discussing the Green Man in this video I thought I would talk about the Horned God rather than just Pan or Kerninus. So the Horned God I actually generally see more as an archetype than a deity. I see deities as manifesting different archetypes. One archetype will have you know, hundreds of thousands even of gods um, that sort of have emerged out of that archetype and one deity might actually encapsulate more than one archetype as well and that is quite common. But the Horn God I don't see as much as a deity as an archetype in that he kind of encompasses all these different types of deities and um, in the context of Wicca that is pretty much literally what he is because in Wicca the Horned God is um, the God, he is the, ma the male element, he is um, the divine masculine and in Wiccan belief the God and the Goddess both in encapsulate, encompass within themselves all gods, all goddesses. So the Horned God very literally does actually encompass um, to for a lot of Wiccans all gods, all male divinity. Oh you're kidding me. I shut the door on the shed because it's such a windy day so that I wouldn't have bees and wasps flying in um, and a bee just flew in the window. I'm not impressed. <laughs> okay I'm done saving bees. Um, where was I? When the Horned God was originally conceived um, I don't think there was necessarily that understanding that he actually encapsulated all gods. Originally the god and goddess of the Wicca, I, as far as I understand it, were actually seen as just two deities that the Wicca um, worship and they weren't necessarily seen as these sort of ultimate archetypes of male and female um, divinities. Um, so the Horn God kind of arose out of um, various different thoughts and concepts about witchcraft um, very early on in the development of Wicca and if you're interested in that I would definitely recommend reading Ronald Hutton's A Triumph of the Moon because he gets into that um, in quite a lot of depth. So the Horned God is actually quite um, a complex figure. Um, he's strange in that he is, I feel he's a little bit more specific than the goddess of Wicca. I think the closest equivalence we can find for the horned god in the goddess would be um, the triple goddess or, or a moon goddess, so that association between her and the moon. And then in um, the horned god we see a, a sort of parallel connection with the sun which is something I'm going to get into um, in a minute now. So I think without further ado I'll start going through the cards that I've chosen for this god, but I just wanted to have a little bit of a preamble explaining that um, he's a bit complex, he's got lots of different aspects and this is really just my take on him and um, the impressions that I've I've received of him through kind of Wiccan, Wiccan myths and um, the Wiccan Wheel of the Year and um, various other uh, bits and pieces and I'm going to be taking Pan into account because Pan was obviously a major 
inspiration for the figure of the horned god and um, Kernunos as well but I'll, I think I'll talk about that um, when I'm going through the cards. So I thought the first thing to address was um, the question of the king of pentacles. This is a card that I chose for the green man, um, for his associations with abundance and growth, um, but also with sort of sacrifice. I feel like um, the king of pentacles in the Shadowscapes deck um, definitely has this strong sort of sacrificial sense to him. He's quite a Wiccan king of pentacles, I think. There's definitely some major connection with the concept of um, the, uh, the, the horned god or the, the Wiccan uh, god going on here. Um, there's this sense, with his arms outstretched and sort of attached to the tree as he is, in one way you can see that he's sort of um, opening up his arms and offering his abundance um, and the abundance of nature, but in another sense there's definitely a strong sacrificial element here. Um, this King of Pentacles even has horns, um, but I wanted to kind of choose this card and talk about it a bit to just say that I've decided not to not to choose this as one of my main cards for the Horned God because I chose him for the Green Man. And as I said, I feel that the Green Man is a major influence in the sort of overall archetype of the Horned God. So um, this is definitely, all of the cards that I chose for the Green Man will be relevant also for the Horned God. Um, uh, but this card in particular, I think this is maybe where the greatest crossover point is between the, the figure of the Green Man and the Horned God. Um, this, in many ways, this card really just does depict um, the Horned God in his association with vegetation, with the natural world, um, with the kind of harvest and decline and rebirth kind of cycle um, of um, the natural world and that sort of Wiccan mythology of uh, the Great Mother sort of being all things but the God being the body of it, uh, that which comes and which goes again so it's kind of constantly coming in and out of being. But the court card that I would choose even more so than the King of Pentacles um, for the Horned God is actually the King of Wands. And this king also actually has horns um, and he just has a, a much more sort of fiery, um, creative but also destructive kind of feel to him which I feel very much taps into that association of the horned god with the animal kingdom as opposed to um, vegetation and that is something that I mentioned in my video um, about the green man is that I feel that the green man aspect of the horned god is sort of um, the vegetation, the trees, the undergrowth whereas in the horned god we have this association with the hunt and with um, particularly with stags um, and, and everything and so on and, and just with the sort of bloodier aspect of um, animal nature and animals killing and eating one another because plants derive all of their energy from the sun, from um, the soil and from the rain and they're not active whereas animals are active and they are either subsuming plants or they are subsuming other animals. Now of course the plants do subsume animals and plants in that and they subsume them after they've returned to the earth but it's a very passive kind of cycle um, where they're only taking they're only receiving that which has already been kind of returned to the earth, whereas animals are eating plants that are alive, they're eating animals that I know they have just killed and um, for the purpose of eating them. So there is this much kind of, as I said, bloodier and more destructive, I think, element to um, that side of the natural world, uh, where we have that sort of, maybe it taps us in more to um, the dark, aspects of divinity, the dark aspects of Cosmo. The animal chosen in this deck to represent the King of Wands is the lion, who, who is obviously um, very predatory, associated with the hunt and with the kill. And so we're very definitely being tapped into that sense, that kind of darker sense of Cosmos. We're being reminded of the destructive aspects, the fact that all of this creative life can only come about because um, it also dies, and that life and death are inextricably intertwined. And I feel like the Horned God um, is maybe more often associated with that sort of death aspect. Um, 
in Wicca in particular, I feel like the goddess, because she is seen as sort of all encompassing and that she contains the entire cycle within her, I think she's often more associated with life and with the, with the life giving process that she's giving birth. Um, and I think the Dark Mother doesn't actually get enough attention for me. Um, there obviously there is the crone, but the crone isn't exactly the same as the devouring mother. We have maiden mother and crone. Um, but the mother aspect of the triple goddess is seen as a very creative, positive, giving um, kind of woman. And the crone isn't actually seen as being destructive. She's just seen as the waning aspect of the mother. Um, but we do also then have the dark mother, um, the mother who also devours, who doesn't just produce what she devours. But whereas, as I say in Wicca, I feel like that role has been given to the god. And the god is very much more associated with death and sacrifice um, and also killing. But I also chose this card for its association with fire and the sun and the creativity aspect of that because of course um, the god, the horned god and the god of Wicca is associated very much with the sun too and there's a lot of kind of fiery creative energy going on there as well so we kind of have that strange dichotomy of the very destructive with the very creative which is what kind of the fire element is all about. Um, fire is very active, very swift, very powerful, and it is sort of equally creative and destructive. It's sort of, um, metaphorically, it is seen as giving that creative drive, the sort of underlying desires and, and need and, and drive. Um, but also at the same time, fire is, as I said, it's, it consumes and um, I think there's some connection here as well with the idea of creativity being sort of finite uh, and that once it's kind of, once a person, once um, a creative impulse, once anything is sort of burned up, then it is gone. And it's, nothing is ever infinite in that way. Nobody's energy is ever infinite. And that's something um, that is always worth considering with um, maybe not so much the King of Wands, but also um, the, the Knight of Wands and remembering that your energy is finite and you have to be careful about where you choose to put that energy and to remember that everywhere you exert energy, um, you are choosing not to exert it in another place. Um, so yeah, I chose this card as the, the primary court card for the Horned God over um, the King of Pentacles. And as a result, I decided to not choose the Sun as one of the main cards that I'm going to talk about because I feel like the King of Wands and the Sun, for my purposes here, have pretty similar kind of associations going on. There is a kind of childlike naivety and innocence associated with the sun though that isn't present in the king of wands which is why I kind of just wanted to mention this card and um, this is kind of tapping into that hinted aspect of the horn god which is the reborn sun sun as in s o n so with the Sun card as in S-U-N, we definitely have that association of um, not only the kind of death cycles of the Horned God, but the implication that um, as the sort of the goddess subsumes um, the God back into her, and uh, I suppose that's, um, that's the way in which we actually see the Devouring Mother maybe in Wicca, is this sort of way that the God is seen to sacrifice himself for her, to her. So after um, the god has been subsumed back into the process of goddess, um, he is then reborn um, as the sun. And um, this card is very definitely reminiscent of that. Of course, um, the king of pentacles in particular um, definitely reminds us too of the fact that Pan is such a major influence in the figure of the horned god. And that sort of association uh, with nature and abundance. But then of course we also have the sort of more promiscuous side of Pan and um, the more sort of um, Pan or the horned god as the debaucher. And I felt that the devil was um, a very important card to choose for him in this aspect. I think Pan as the debauch, sort of um, promiscuous, kind of tricksy kind of character, hasn't made himself hugely known in the figure of the Horn God, certainly not in modern day Wicca. Um, but it's important to remember that his influence is very much still there and um, I think much more than this sort of devil aspect of the Horn God, we see much more of that sort of 
idealised association um, of the romantics with Pan, um, with the forest and the sort of um, that sort of really lush kind of um, there is this sense that um, the romantics, particularly in that period, um, saw Pan as this embodiment of the sort of um, infinite creative power of nature and that's something that I talked about with the green man as well. Um, green man and Pan definitely have a link there and um, there's definitely a lot um, in common um, that we definitely just see this sort of feeling that you know, while we have um, human civilization, and I suppose it was sort of pre any understanding that human civilization and technology and industrialization was actually having um, a negative effect on the natural course of nature on this planet. Um, so we definitely see this sort of um, feeling of nature as being something that is just impossible to repress. And this sort of tapping into the energies of Pan that was going on at the time of the Romantics was very much kind of in opposition to the general consensus where um, it was seen as being the ultimate progress for civilization was seen as being um, man's emancipation from nature, that um, industrialization and technology from the Enlightenment onwards and in fact from earlier on, was very much geared towards, um, as I say, emancipating humans from nature, as though we could somehow separate ourselves from nature that in that we would no longer need it, that we would no longer be in reliance of natural cycles, and that we would be able to just completely exert utter control over the planet. And I think that the romantic tendency to idealise pan and to um, idealise nature and sex and kind of all things natural was very much in opposition to that. It was very much kind of holding up the natural process and our reliance on that natural process as being something sacred. But we don't yet see that sort of feeling of that creative life force as being something finite or something that might actually be snuffed out. Um, so I think with the devil we see an interesting kind of combination of things. We definitely see that sort of association with Pan as being perhaps a figure that um, sometimes you feel that perhaps he's just a bit too far, he's a bit too wild. Um, he's a god that is um, maybe a little bit dangerous um, and he's very much associated with kind of natural human foibles and natural human tendencies towards excess, um, which obviously the devil is... Um, very, very closely um, intertwined with um, the god Pan and um, has a lot of the same kind of associations. But I like to think also with the god Pan and with the, the devil card that we're being reminded that actually that idealised natural force um, that at the time of um, the Romantic poets was seen as being sort of just a constant and um, something that would just always be there and um, that um, could not necessarily be destroyed, that could be risen above, but not something that um, we would ever actually need to um, save in order to save ourselves. Um, I think this card, and in fact the figure of Pan in general, kind of taps into that feeling of um, the excessiveness of some parts of human nature as being very destructive and dangerous to oneself and to one's surroundings, i.e. and the ecosystem. So I think that's kind of an interesting thing to think about in relation to the devil as well, because of course um, some of these destructive tendencies that we have, um, sort of obsessive tendencies, addictive tendencies, um, are not only destructive to the individual but can be very destructive to the environment as well and that's um, definitely worth thinking about. But as I say, I feel like this hasn't made its way into sort of the modern horned god a whole lot, um, perhaps because it's seen as being a more kind of negative and very almost sort of human kind of aspect to Pan. Um, I suppose as well in modern day Wicca and just in the modern day, the kinds of excesses that were seen as being so sinful at the time of the Romantics are not necessarily seen as being so transgressive nowadays. Um, the Horned God is still associated with sex um, and um, sex in all its forms. Um, you know, it's, it's very definitely um, an extramarital kind of sex that we're talking about when, when we talk about Pan and the Horned God. Something very primal and primitive and um, just utterly instinctive. 
and often actually associated with homosexual sex as well. Um, and of course in today's world uh, we don't have that same sort of feeling of that being you know absolutely forbidden um, of all of those things as being sinful um, we we live in a society where sex is you know generally speaking considered to be a lot more um, a lot less sinful a lot less transgressive um, extramarital sex is in a lot of societies in well in a lot of western societies seen as the norm so I think we have that there's less of this transgressive quality to the horn god as a result of that. Um, it's still very idealised, I think, um, in that there is still that association with him with that sort of primitive primal desire and in instinct. Um, but I think it's being idealised in a different way, I think, in modern society where it's being sort of taken as a given that um, certain human impulses and urges are natural and normal and are accepted by society um, but just that he's sort of a celebration of that and a reminder to tap into that more kind of animal instinct, instinctive self. So I've kind of already touched on some of the things that I wanted to talk about with this card um, but the minor arcana card that I chose, the, the pips card that I chose for the horned god is the five of wands. I wanted to get a five in there um, and this was at a point where I hadn't considered um, choosing the king of, of um, wands. I was still going to just talk about the king of pentacles and I wanted to get a wands card in there too because there is definitely this sense of sort of, as I said, a very destructive kind of feeling uh, to the horn god. Um, and not, that doesn't necessarily have to be a negative thing, it's definitely seen as being sort of part of the natural process. But as I said, he's very much associated with death and the hunt and, um, and just kind of fighting and combat and conflict. And I felt that the fives in tarot, particularly and um, the five of wands, the five of swords also, but I felt like the five of swords had a bit too much of an edge to it. Whereas the five of wands um, reminds me much more of two stags clashing antlers. There's this sense of it not being a conflict, which is sort of in sort of bad blood or that is sort of unnecessarily vicious or um, out of hand. It's more, a a card that reminds me of the natural kind of conflicts that come about um, in society and just in the natural world in general. That sort of push and pull um, that is um, just an inevitable part of reality, of existence. Um, again, the creative and destructive cycle. And um, this card very definitely reminds me of that and it's kind of almost like a more human or societal take <clears throat> or um, manifestation of that natural kind of process in life. One of the major myths of Wicca is that of the, the Oak King and the Holly King fighting um, at um, Midsummer, isn't it? Yes, Midsummer. Um, and that sort of sacrifice of the, the, the light kind of the, the sun, summer god, uh, and that sort of descent into uh, the dark half of the year and um, with the kind of dark aspect of the god and that sort of necessary bloodletting and that sort of sacrifice which then you know through the dark half of the year we have the god um, declining and dying. Apologies if I've got that a little bit backwards I really should have looked that up before I started this video but I didn't think of it and it's not a myth <clears throat> that I'm particularly big into you know it's not something that is a part of my particular um, spirituality or my practice and um, but it is an interesting myth and in that again you know we have this sort of sense of um, very much attached to the animal kingdom that sense of kind of a hierarchy coming and going and that um, one thing that makes me uncomfortable about that sort of thinking and um, that particular myth and this sort of focus on the kind of conflict oriented parts of the natural kingdom is that sort of very strong belief that we have in our modern society in um, in um, survival of the fittest and this idea that it is inevitable that we need to fight each other and um, constantly be putting other people down or other um, aspects of nature or life down and destroying them so that um, the stronger ones can kind of come forth. Um, 
it's 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 one of those sort of it's one of those paradigms that has a lot of truth in it because of course um destruction is absolutely necessary for creation and um, but i feel it has a slightly dangerous tendency in it um to sort of tend towards um legitimizing and and just sort of authorizing a certain level of kind of vicious and unnecessary cruelty um but I feel like I said this is why I chose the five of wands as opposed to the five of swords because I feel like the five of wands more taps into um, the healthy aspects of conflict and um, the aspects of conflict that challenge us and that push us to become stronger versions of ourselves and um, it's sort of a card that doesn't shy away from the fact that um, there, yes there is always conflict in life, in society and um, between us, that is just part of life but that we just kind of have to embrace that and embrace it with grace and with kindness. And like I say, to sort of allow that challenge to better us rather than allowing it to um, let us act from somewhere other than from love. I think in modern paganism, the question of the hunt and conflict and war and things like that being seen as sacred is a little bit tricky and it's something that we all feel quite differently about. Um, so many of us are pacifists and really detest the idea of killing an animal needlessly but for, for most of us I think we're not so com comfortable with those aspects of reality and of society and um, it feels very wrong for us to revere or put them on a pedestal and it definitely is very very problematic it's it's quite a difficult thing to find the balance for um and you know th this is something that i struggle with too um because i mean obviously the morrigan is a very kind of and um, i don't mean this in a derogatory way obviously but she's a very kind of trendy deity right now and that's obviously something you know being a devotee of the morrigan is obviously something that i do struggle with because i am a pacifist and I loathe the fact that as humans we wage war and um, I loathe all forms of unnecessary violence but at the same time there is something in these kinds of deities that is very primal and that definitely connects us to some natural cycle and I think it's just a matter of finding the underlying energy and the, the, the kind of the natural part of that, the cycle within that that is only destructive to the level that is necessary for, um, for the life-death-life cycle and um, that is devoid of any ill intent and any sort of um, any evil. Now I could go on about evil all day, maybe I will in another video because um, I definitely see evil as a human construct and I see it as something that is that comes about as a, as a result of consciousness that uh, a deed is only evil if the person committing it is conscious of it and conscious that they are doing a wrongdoing. Maybe not even that they have to know that they're doing something wrong, but just that they're conscious of what they're inflicting on another person. And obviously that's the kind of energy that I don't want anywhere near me. That's the kind of energy that we don't want to be revering, that we don't want to be putting on a pedestal, that we don't want to be worshipping. But there is something kind of underlying that there is this sort of healthy conflict, healthy challenge, this feeling of this energy of wanting to be strong and also wanting to accept that death is a part of life, life, and that um, and that it's just necessary, and that unfortunately, um, pain and suffering and challenge and conflict is just a part of this life. It is part of life, um, and I think there's something in that that in our in our in our desire to kind of distance ourselves from the evil doings of humanity, we have sort of managed to distance ourselves ourselves from. Um, a very natural part of life and, and we're sort of trying to avoid that a lot of the time, particularly in a lot of um, major religions. There is this sense that we're sort of trying to avoid and push away and push into the shadow and um, those kind of more destructive aspects of ourselves and of the world and that's definitely not a healthy choice either. So um, I think finding a healthy way to work through those kinds of energies is um, definitely beneficial to us on a spiritual level and definitely on a personal level too. And finally I wanted to mention the lovers.
um, because the Horned God, of course, is also a consort of the Goddess. He is seen as being her lover, he is also seen as being her son, he is this sort of, as I said, there is this kind of panentheistic belief in um, Wicca. Um, personally, I see, I know a lot of people would see Wicca as being duotheistic, that um, they see divinity as being in two parts, male and female, but I actually, I often see it as being panentheistic, in that the goddess is sort of the transcendent aspect, um, and the god is the immanent aspect, so that we have the sort of goddess, which is the world, but also beyond the world. She is all that is and all that is not, whereas the god is all that is. That uh, He is um, her child, and he is her lover, he, there's this sort of, um, and you know, he is sacrificed to her, he is devoured by her if you like um, and that there is this sort of cycle with the god being born and dying and being reborn again and the goddess kind of is the overarching um, everything. So the lovers is definitely a potent card um, for this god too and I think it also again taps into that association with sex and with the sort of natural animal instincts and desires and that kind of thing um, which is very definitely associated with Pan and um, with that sort of primal fiery energy of the horned god. Um, also though there is this just association with I think connectivity and um, sensuality and the sort of visceral nature of being and um, this is an aspect of paganism that a lot of people are very attracted to and um, this sort of celebration of it's not just sort of debauchery and um, excess or anything like that you know it's it's that's one very particular way of understanding Pan or the Horn God um, but it's, it's also this sort of celebration of um, human connectedness and our dependency on each other and on the earth, on the planet, um, and sort of that rejection of that sort of enlightenment, kind of capitalism, modern progress kind of idea that we're trying to transcend our, our dependence on the earth, that we're trying to develop our technology to a point where we no longer have to be um, caught up in the natural cycles of the earth and um, whereas you know the horned god and paganism in general kind of celebrates the fact that we are caught up in just a wonderful cycle that we can never fully understand or fully control it celebrates the fact that we are connected that we are linked to everything and um to each other and i think as much as I dislike the very kind of heteronormative aspects of Wicca and the Horned God and Goddess and that sort of whole male-female sexuality thing, um, as much as that makes me kind of uncomfortable and doesn't feel to me like it has anything much to do with how I see the world, um, it still kind of has a nice kind of reminder in it of that bond that we form with other people, whether it's between a man and a woman, or between people of two genders, or whatever combination it is of people, whether it's sexual, whether it's not. I think the lover's card definitely reminds us of that deep, deep bond that we can have with another person, and um, it's definitely rooted in a dependence on other people. And although we're told, of course, that love, we should never be truly depend on the people that we love and you know that um, codependence is is um, negative, that it is destructive and that is definitely true to an extent that um, we need to have that ability to be happy in our own skin and happy in our own right but at the end of the day the reality is we fall in love with other people because we are social beings and because we are dependent on other people for our survival and you know maybe not for our physical survival always but for our emotional survival we need other people and um, you know, we might be perfectly capable of being happy if um, one particular person falls out of our life and like I say, again, it's kind of a, a tricky balance to find that you don't want to be pinning all of your happiness on one person. That's never kind of a healthy way of being. You don't want to be putting your power in the hands of another person. But at the same time, I think it's important to also acknowledge that um, part of our power is in the hands of others. It is in the hands of um, our environment and the people in our lives. and. Our happiness 
does actually depend on on having loved ones in our lives and that's kind of a humbling thought so um, I just wanted to throw that in there at the end to kind of give a bit of a softer edge to the horned god. I've just realized that I never actually talked about curliness in this video sorry about that the reason being and I was going to explain this as I went through the cards there isn't actually um Kernunus is one of these sort of almost makey uppy kind of gods where we don't actually have any clear representations of him. We don't have um, a wealth of evidence for him as a god that was worshipped. There are figures, kind of horned god figures that appear in Celtic art, um, but he's kind of one of these strange gods that is sort of... I don't really have any very strong associations with them and for me Kernunos and the Horn God are kind of one and the same. Um, he really is just this archetypal image, he's literally just an image that we have seen on Celtic art. Pan, there's a lot more kind of archaeological evidence and actually you know written evidence and there's, there's more of a you know we have the mythology we kind of we have stories about Pan we don't have stories about Kernuno so that's kind of why I haven't actually really factored him into this video to me he really just that name is really just another name for the horned god so yeah I think that pretty much concludes my thoughts I hope you enjoyed this before I go I will just mention that um I have always had I used to call them Kernunos prayer beads for sale in the Etsy shop but actually Recently I have created a new design um, when I was sort of buying in a new order of beads I decided that I would change up the design um, because I wanted to incorporate an antler kind of pendant um, in the design rather than the leaf and the sun that I had been using before. So from now on um, these are the new, I'm just going to call them Horned God uh, prayer beads. So by the time I post this video these should be up for sale on the Etsy shop so I'll link them below. Um, they're very similar to the old Kerninos design in, except that they are longer as you might be able to see and um, well they're they you know extremely easily fit over the head so if that's an important thing for you they're by far the longest and biggest prayer beads um, that I make and um, I will be making another video soon about prayer beads because I've been making lots. I'm not planning on really making many prayer beads when I'm in Edinburgh but I have been pre-making a lot so they'll all be going up soon on the Etsy shop. I will still be offering a custom design order and the custom order will now just encompass anything that is not pre-made. So yeah, if you're interested in checking these out, um, then do, and um, I will leave it there for the moment, and I will talk to you again soon. Take care, guys.